Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This video is video 2 in our series on flying RNAV GPS approaches. In this video we'll demonstrate how to fly an LPV RNAV GPS approach using the Garmin G1000 equipped Cessna 172. In video 1 of this series we covered the basics of RNAV GPS approaches. We discussed what they are, how they're designed, and talked about the different types of RNAV GPS approaches that are available. If you haven't watched that video, I'd recommend doing so before watching this one, and I'll leave a link to that video in this video's description. It's also a good idea to be familiar with the basics of instrument flying and the basics of instrument approaches before viewing this video, and I'll leave links to those videos in this video's description as well. If you're not familiar with the operations of the Garmin G1000, it's a good idea to get familiar with that as well, so I'll leave a link to the playlist for that training series in this video's description also. I also want to mention that this video was made with Sim Update 13 Beta, which was game version 1.34.16.0, and that was released on September 20th, 2023. Uh, this version of the sim corrects a few glitches with the G1000 that were introduced in Aircraft and Avionics Update 2. Most of those glitches involve the VNAV system on the G1000, which we won't be using to fly this approach. So if you haven't been able to update to that version of the sim, uh, you should still be able to fly this lesson. You don't need to update uh, necessarily to be able to fly this approach. And the public release of uh, Sim Update 13 was scheduled for September 28th, 2023, at the time this video was in production. Uh, so the public release of the Sim Update should be out by the time this video is released, unless the release schedule changes between now and then. Uh, so if something looks slightly different about how the G1000 is operating in this video from the way it's operating in your sim, the update might be why. But again, you should be able to fly this approach with the old sim, with sim update 12 or avionics and aircraft update number two, uh, that version. Or you should be able to fly it with sim update three, 13. Either version should work to fly this approach. Before we get in the airplane, let's do a quick review of what an LPV approach is. An LPV approach is a type of RNAV GPS approach which gives you approved lateral and vertical guidance during the approach. LPV stands for Localizer Performance with Vertical Navigation. With LP lateral guidance, the course width narrows as you get closer to the runway. It starts at a width of one nautical mile when you're in the terminal area, which is any time you're within 30 nautical miles of the departure or destination airport. It narrows down to 0.3 nautical miles either side of the course when you get within 2 nautical miles of the final approach fix. At the final approach fix, it gradually narrows to only 700 feet wide at the runway threshold. This mimics the sort of sensitivity you would get when flying an ILS localizer, hence the term localizer performance. Since you get very precise lateral guidance to the runway, as well as a GPS-generated glide path, this makes it very similar to the guidance you get on an ILS approach. So you basically fly it in the same way that you would fly an ILS approach, following the lateral and vertical guidance from the GPS down to a decision height, where you either get the runway in sight and proceed to a visual landing, or you don't and execute the missed approach. With this precise lateral and vertical guidance all the way to the runway threshold, LPV approaches usually have minimums very similar to that of an ILS. With the decision height as low as 200 feet and visibility as low as 1800 RVR or one half statute mile, depending on the runway and approach lighting system available. Like an ILS approach, you can fly this approach by coupling it to the autopilot and or flight director or hand fly it using raw data. To demonstrate flying the approach, we'll conduct a short IFR flight from Pine Bluff Grider Field in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. The identifier for that airport is Kilo, Papa, Bravo, Foxtrot to Stuttgart Airport in Stuttgart, Arkansas. The identifier there is Kilo, Sierra, Golf, Tango. We'll plan to fly the LPV RNAV GPS approach to runway 36 at Stuttgart. After departing Pine Bluff, we'll navigate direct to Hokum Waypoint, which serves as both an initial and intermediate approach fix for this approach. We'll assume that we request and get clearance to fly the approach straight in without flying the procedure turn at Hokum, using it as an intermediate approach fix. 
Our filed route will be Pine Bluff direct to Hogum, direct to Stuttgart, though in real life you could likely just file direct from airport to airport and then request direct to uh, Hogum once you get airborne uh, off of Pine Bluff. We'll file for an altitude of 3,000 feet for this northeast bound flight, and this will keep us above the off-route obstruction clearance altitude between these two airports, as well as above the MSA and all procedure altitudes on the approach. The flight is just over 31 track miles, which should take us about uh, 15 minutes to fly in the System 172. We'll plan to depart runway 36 at Pine Bluff. We've checked the takeoff and departure procedures for Pine Bluff. There are takeoff obstacle notes, but there are no special departure procedures and no takeoff minimums. So we know that we'll be safe using the standard diverse departure procedure of flying runway heading to 400 feet AGL before we make a turn on course. We'll assume that the weather at Pine Bluff Airport is good enough that we can get back in and that we feel comfortable departing. The weather at Stuttgart is reported as calm winds, one mile visibility, ceiling of 300 overcast, temperature and dew point of 15 degrees C, and an altimeter of 2992. We'll assume that we filed an alternate for the flight and that it is a legal alternate. We'll also say that there is a NOTAM for the approach lights to runway 36 being out of service since they appear to be missing in Microsoft Flight Simulator. All right, so let's take an in-depth look at the uh, approach and the approach plate uh, to make sure that we are familiar with all the information that we need to know to fly this approach. Over the top right-hand corner, it gives the title of the procedure. It is the RNAV GPS to runway 36, and it is for Stuttgart Municipal Carl Humphrey Field in Stuttgart, Arkansas. It's got the identifier, the FA identifier there of SGT, and the top left, it tells us that this is in Stuttgart, Arkansas, is where the uh, airfield is located. Uh, top left of the briefing strip here, it gives us some wash channel information. I think they just stick this on here because on like a ILS approach or something with a ground-based nav aid, this is where you put the frequency uh, for that uh, type of approach. So they felt like they needed to put something in here. There's not really anything that we can do with this as a pilot. It's not like we can change the wash channel. Uh, so it's just there for informational purposes only. There's not really much we can do with that. It does give us the inbound approach course. It is 360 and we can see that is uh, duplicated on the plan view down here. Then it gives us some uh, runway information for runway 36, tells us the runway landing length is 6,015 feet. Uh, tells us that the touchdown zone elevation for runway 36 is 224 feet MSL and that the airport elevation is also 224 feet MSL. Underneath that, we have a little remark that says RNP approach, which just tells us that this is uh, an approach that has a certain navigation standard. Uh, until we get to the final approach fix, we need to have an accuracy of 0.3 nautical miles, uh, or actually as we get to the final approach fix. And then of course with the LPV approach, it's going to narrow down from there. Uh, under that, we have the little T that tells us uh, that this has something unusual about the departure. This means that it has uh, obstacle departure notes or it has non-standard takeoff minimums, or it has an obstacle departure procedure. None of that is really applicable to, to us as an arrival, but just something we need to be aware of when we depart back out of here. And then the A means that it has a uh, non-standard uh, minimums for filing this airport as an alternate. Uh, so if we're gonna file this airport an alternate, we wanna take a look at that and see uh, what changed there. Then we have the notes section. Most of this does not apply to us. It says when using a uh, local altimeter setting or when the local altimeter setting is not received and has some notes about what you need to do to the minimums, if that is the case, we are gonna get the local altimeter setting. So that is not an issue. It says for an inoperative approach lighting system when using uh, Little Rock Airport altimeter settings, we have to do some adjustments to the minimums. Uh, but even though we have the inoperative uh, approach lighting system here, uh, we don't have to do this because we are not using the Little Rock altimeter setting. So that is not applicable here. Uh, we have the type of approach lighting system that it has. This is a medium intensity approach lighting system with sequence flashing lights. So it's got the rabbits and the white T, but again, it's missing in flight simulator. So we're gonna have to do some adjustments to our minimums. Uh, for that approach lighting system being not present or inoperative uh, in flight simulator. 
It's got our missed approach instructions down here. It tells us in the event of a missed approach, uh, we're going to climb straight ahead to 2000, go direct to Zedek, and then hold. And you can see that's what's depicted on the plan view here. It's got the holding pattern at Zedek. And then we also have the in the uh, uh, profile view, we've also got the same directions here, straight ahead to 2000, and go to Zedek. Underneath that, it does have the frequencies that we're going to use and the order that we're going to use them. It does have automated weather uh, so that we can tune in and listen to the weather. Then we would be talking to Little Rock Approach when we are on uh, the approach. It has the clearance delivery frequency for once we get on the ground and the Unicon that we'll talk to to make uh, and the common traffic advisory frequency that we would use to make uh, our traffic calls once we are handed off from approach uh, to the common traffic advisory frequency. So looking at the plan view of the chart, up in the top right corner, we do have an a, a MSA or a minimum uh, safe altitude listed on the approach. This is based on the waypoint for runway 36 there at Stuttgart. And it says as long as you're within 25 nautical miles, of that fix, then you know this MSA will be applicable. MSA is 2,500 feet. And again, all this MSA tells us is that if we are within this distance, then uh, we can get down to this altitude and still have our uh, legal minimum IFR obstacle clearance of 1,000 feet above all obstacles in this sector. Again, this is not a procedure altitude, meaning that we can't descend down to this altitude say once we're within 25 nautical miles of runway 36 in the real world, we do need clearance from ATC to descend down to that altitude, unlike a terminal arrival area, which you see on a lot of uh, GPS approaches nowadays, where you could actually descend down uh, to that altitude. That's actually a procedure altitude. You can use it in flight simulator if you're not using ATC. Uh, to assume that you get clearance once you're in this sector to go ahead and descend down to this altitude. Uh, just like any other approach plate, it does depict the water here. So we do have a river over here and a couple of lakes depicted here. We do have the tallest obstacle over here, 1,424 uh, feet MSL. So that's where that's located and the height that it's located at. And uh, then we have a couple of different other obstacles uh, that are closer to the airport so it's got those depicted and has those uh, marked as to high, how high those are so looking at the procedure itself we do have a feeder route coming in from pine bluff vor we are not going to utilize that we'll navigate direct to uh, hogum instead and use that as an intermediate affix uh, but if you were to take the route from Pine Bluff VOR, all you do is load it up in the GPS. You navigate direct to Pine Bluff VOR, and then it tells you that uh, the MEA on this route uh, from Pine Bluff, and it looks like it's pointing at uh, Okoyu, uh, initial approach fix, is uh, the 2,000 feet. It's a 049 course, and it's 15.2 nautical miles long. And if you flew that, you'd fly from there into Okoyu, uh, and then you would go uh, from Okoyu to Hogum and then on in on in on the approach there. It does tell you uh, that Okoyu is an initial approach fix and that it has a 2,000 foot uh, procedure altitude. So you could descend if you're cleared for the approach down to 2,000 feet uh, once you hit Okoyu and you do not have to do the procedure turn. It does say no PT on a 090 course and the length of that segment is five miles long. We do have two of these initial approach fix. You can use Okoyu if you're coming in from the northwest. You can use Kyle if you're coming in from the northeast. And uh, you would just hit the fix and then proceed in on the course. Again, it says no PT on these two uh, outboard initial approach fixes uh, and gives you a procedure altitude. And then you go from the initial approach fix to Hogum and then in on the approach from there. We will be using Hogum. We'll be navigating direct to Hogum. We will use it as an intermediate fix. You can see it's labeled IF slash IAF, which means it's both an intermediate fix and initial approach fix. Uh, if we navigated to it as the initial approach fix, we would need to do this holding pattern in lieu of the procedure turn. But it is legal if you're approaching the intermediate fix within 90 degrees to use that as your starting fix for the approach and not to have to do the procedure turn if you're cleared to do so uh, by ATC. So we'll assume that we are going to get that clearance and we'll just navigate direct to Hogum and then on in on the approach from there. 
You'll notice once you get to Hogum, you have the segment from Hogum to Laius, which is the final approach fix, or FAF, uh, that we have a course of 360. We have a procedure altitude of 1,900 feet. So if you are established on that segment, you can go ahead and clear for the approach. You can go ahead and descend down to 1,900 feet. And then that segment is six miles long. We do have an inter, uh, not an intermediate fix. We have a, uh, a kind of a step down fix uh, of MARV, uh, which is three nautical miles uh, from the runway. Uh, this is only used if you're flying the LNAV procedure. It's not going to be applicable for the LPV approach. And then we have a waypoint right at the runway threshold that's uh, designated RW36. And that is, uh, if we were to shoot the LNAV approach, that would be our missed approach point. But we are shooting, shooting an LPV, so our missed approach point is going to be our arrival at our decision altitude. Looking at our profile view down here, you can see that as we approach Hogum, if we're on course or in that holding pattern, uh, we have a platform altitude of 2,000 feet until we get to Hogum. Once we hit Hogum, we can descend down to 1,900 feet, and then the lightning bolt arrow there indicates that that's where we'll intercept the glide path. And so we'll intercept the glide path and ride that down to our decision altitude. It does list a uh, step down altitude at MARV intersection, but it tells us that that is only applicable uh, if we look at the asterisk here, if we're shooting the LNAV approach, not the LPV. And then we also have a visual descent point that is only applicable to shooting the LNAV approach. And then here is our RW36 waypoint uh, at the uh, runway threshold. And again, it gives the distances between each of that, these fixes. So from Hogum down to Laius, it's six nautical miles. It's two nautical miles from Laius to Marv. 1.9 to the visual descent point, which won't be on our GPS. We'll see three miles once we pass Marv. And then it's 1.1 from the uh, uh, visual descent point to the runway threshold. Uh, the LPV minimums, you can see it tells you that it is a decision altitude and not an MDA. So we have a decision altitude of 474 feet, which is 254, 250 feet above the ground. And then our visibility required is three quarters mile to shoot this approach. But again, with the approach lighting system being an operative, we're gonna to have to make an adjustment to that, which we'll talk about in a uh, second. The approach minimums are the same for all categories of aircraft. We are category A, but it doesn't matter if you're a B, C, or D. The minimums for the LB, LPV approach are all the same. And taking a look at the data that is on the airport diagram, it gives the airport elevation again. It gives the touchdown zone elevation again. Gives us the runway diagram with the length and width of all the different runways. Shows us where the rotating beacon is. Shows us where the approach uh, comes in from. So it's not exactly exactly aligned with runway 36 here, uh, but it is uh, coming in pretty much straight in. Does show us the approach lighting system, which again is missing in flight simulator, so we'll have to consider that an operative. And then it tells us that the uh, inten medium intensity runway lighting on 1836 and 927 is pilot controlled in the real world, as are the runway end identifier lights, which is two strobes on either side of the runway uh, for both runway 18 and uh, 27. Those are also pilot controlled. As we mentioned earlier, the approach lighting system in Flight Simulator for this airport, for this runway, is missing. Uh, it is uh, not being depicted, so we will consider it inoperative. And anytime you have an inoperative approach lighting system, you want to go to this inoperative components table uh, that tells you how to adjust your minimums. And this is located in the front of uh, every terminal procedures publication. Uh, that is published by the FAA, uh, so you can find it on the FAA website, but you can also Google it. Just make sure that you're looking at the approach, uh, the inoperative components table that looks like this. They did revise it recently to bring it up to date with, uh, you know, the newer approach types that they have with LPVs and LNAVs uh, and kind of simplify it as to, uh, you know, it used to be kind of different depending on what approach lighting system it was. They've simplified that for precision approaches now. So it's just one adjustment for all approach lighting types. So we want to take a look at this top line here. It says for any ILS, PRL, PAR, LPV, or GLS approach, we are shooting an LPV approach. This is what we need to do to adjust our minimums. 
it says for any approach lighting system except for omnidirectional approach lighting system uh, that uh, if your approach lighting system is inoperative you need to increase your visibility by one quarter of a mile uh, so if we look here we have a three quarter mile visibility uh, minimum here we need to increase that by one quarter mile and that brings our visibility minimum up to one mile that's required to shoot the approach so that is our new visibility minimum uh, for shooting this approach with the approach lighting system inoperative as far as the use of automation on this approach goes in the Cessna 172 with the G1000, you do have uh, three choices. You can fly it with both the autopilot and the flight director, so all that you have to manage is the throttle until you get down to decision altitude. Uh, you can fly it with just the flight director without the autopilot, so just flying the flight director cues, hand flying, but following those flight director cues to fly the approach. And then uh, you can turn everything off, no autopilot and no flight director, and just try to fly the raw data, uh, hand fly the raw data. Uh, if you are not experienced in flying uh, approaches with vertical guidance or precision approaches, uh, I do recommend starting with the autopilot and the flight director, uh, just to, so all that you have to do is manage your throttle and see what kind of pitch and roll corrections are needed uh, in order to fly the approach, and then uh, try to step in and kick the autopilot off and fly it with just the flight director guidance, and then once you get proficient of that, move over to flying uh, with you know, no autopilot and no flight director if you want to do that. I personally don't have a problem with uh, folks if they want to use uh, the autopilot on this type of approach. Uh, it's probably what a lot of pilots are, with advanced avionics systems are gonna do in real life. Uh, typically, if you have the automation, you're going to use it because it's the safest thing to do. Uh, but if you want to step towards working with no automation and flying it, hand flying it, uh, you have that option too, and that's kind of what I recommend. This is a little bit different with this approach than an ILS because some of you may have quite a bit of experience flying ILSs by this point, and this really flies the same as flying an ILS. So if you've gone out and you've flown high ILSs and you're comfortable flying uh, hand-flying ILSs without an autopilot or a flight director, this one flies exactly the same pretty much other than the needles being magenta. Uh, so there's really no reason that you would need to do the autopilot and then step down from there. You can go ahead and try to fly it with no automation uh, initially if you're comfortable flying those other approaches with no automation. So looking at the techniques we're going to use to uh, fly this approach specifically with the Cessna 172, again, we'll take off from Pine Bluff and once we get to about 400 feet AGL, we will have already loaded the approach on the ground. Uh, so we'll go ahead and send it direct to Hogum Intersection. We'll climb up to 3,000 feet. Uh, so we'll just be navigating in this direction uh, to Hogum Intersection. And we will have loaded the approach so it does not have the procedure turn. We'll talk about how to do that as soon as we hop in the aircraft here. Uh, once we get within about 10 nautical miles, we'll assume that ATC is going to clear us down to 2,500 feet and clear us for the approach. Uh, so we'll go ahead and descend to 2,500 feet and continue to navigate into Hogum. Once we get to Hogum, the aircraft will start sequencing onto the next segment here and start flying towards Laos. Uh, we have been cleared for the approach, so at that point we can go ahead and descend down to 1,900 feet. And once we get to 1,900 feet, we level off, uh, then we'll start preparing uh, to configure for the approach. We will be using the low speed uh, technique for flying uh, approaches with vertical navigation. So we're gonna level at 1,900 feet. Once we get about three miles from Laos, then we'll go ahead and configure and get on our approach speed. Then we'll intercept the glide path and fly the approach on in. We fly that approach, uh, follow that vertical and lateral guidance down to our decision height of 474 feet. So a little bit before 474, we'll take a look up. With the weather set the way that we're gonna set it, we should be able to see the runway at that point and we'll go ahead and, con and uh, continue to a visual landing from there. But if you got to 474, you look up and you don't see anything, that's the time to go ahead and execute the missed approach procedure. Again, the missed approach procedure is just to fly straight ahead to 2000, fly to Zedek. One thing that is a little different about uh, flying a missed approach in the G1000 or the GNS 530 430 is when you get to the runway 36 waypoint, it will go into suspension mode. 
so you will have to hit that OBS button to get it out of suspension mode and get it uh, to navigating to Zedek. But other than that, it flies just like a normal uh, mist approach. A few things I want to mention about how the GPS is going to act as you're uh, flying this approach. It will automatically sequence uh, from the waypoint you pass over to the next waypoint. Again, until you get to runway 36. So once it gets to 36, it will suspend. So you'll, you'll see it sequence as you pass over Hogum, it will sequence to Laius. As you pass over Laius, it will then sequence to Marv. And then when you pass over Marv, it will then sequence to runway 36. Uh, this doesn't affect how you fly the approach. You still just follow that lateral and vertical guidance all the way down to the decision height and it sequencing past the waypoints uh, won't change how you follow the guidance and it won't change uh, how the autopilot uh, flies it'll just fly it continuously and you'll get continuous guidance all the way uh, down from the final approach fix uh, to the missed approach point it will also automatically change the CDI for you you don't have to do anything to the CDI like you do for an ILS or a VOR approach, uh, it will automatically change it to the correct course. One thing that you might notice in Flight Simulator is that the courses may not match up exactly with what's on the chart. I think it shows a track of uh, 002 instead of a 360 track. That's just a uh, quirk with the simulator. Uh, in real life, you know, you'd want to take a look at that and see what's up, why it's not showing the track that it shows on the chart. Uh, but in Flight Sim, the tracks are just slightly off for whatever reason. I've noticed that's also the case with uh, VOR radials as well. They're just slightly off from what you would see in the real world, but it's still accurate as far as getting you to the right place in the sim. So looking at the way we're going to fly the final segment of the approach, again, we're going to use the low speed technique. So once we get about three miles from the glide path intercept, which will be 3.0 distance, from Laius intersection on the GPS. Then we're gonna go ahead and configure for our approach. We'll go ahead and bring the power to 1800 air, RPM. We'll hold our altitude and allow the aircraft to slow. We should already be below 110 knots, but if we're not, we'll let it slow to below 110 knots and we'll put the flaps out to 10. Once we're below 85 knots, we'll go ahead and bring the flaps one notch at a time down to 30 degrees. And then once you are at about 75 knots is when you want to bring the power back in. Uh, then you'll increase that power up to about 2200 to 2400 RPM. Uh, and if you do it at 75 knots, once you get to 2400 RPM, that should get you stabilized in level flight at 70 knots. And we we'll use 70 knots as the approach speed. So you want to lead that application of power just a little bit, about five knots. Once you're stabilized and in level flight at 70 knots, you should have a mile or two before you hit the glide slope intercept or the glide path intercept. Uh, you want to go ahead and accomplish your before landing checklist at this point. And you want to go ahead and uh, do what you're going to do with the autopilot and the flight director. If you want to fly it with raw data or you want to fly it with the autopilot off, this is a good time to go ahead and kick those things off. Once you intercept the glide path, and you're going to go ahead and reduce your power, 1,800 to 2,000 RPMs should uh, get you the descent rate uh, that you want. Again, you're going to want probably about 400 feet per minute, plus or minus, uh, to track that glide path. Uh, then make small changes in pitch and power uh, and heading to track the lateral guidance and the glide path. Again, just like flying an ILS, make very small collections left and right and very small changes in your descent rate to keep that lateral guidance and the glide path centered up. So track the guidance and the glide path down to that decision altitude of 474. Uh, once you get to the decision altitude, you'll either transition to a visual landing or once the required visual cues are in sight, or uh, you'll execute the missed approach uh, in, when it's appropriate. And just throw a little reminder about when should you go missed approach on a approach with vertical guidance. If you do not have the required visual references in sight when you get decision decision altitude, then you need to go ahead and go missed approach. If the required visual references are lost after you've descended below decision altitude, uh, so you've gone below the decision altitude, you had everything in sight, but then you go into a fog bank or whatever and you lose it again. You also need to go missed approach at that point. 
anytime you get a full scale devi deviation on the lateral or vertical guidance uh, without the runway environment in sight, then you need to go missed approach. And again, on a check ride, you're only allowed a three quarter scale deflection uh, on the lateral or vertical guidance before you need to go missed approach. If you go beyond three quarter scale de deviation on a check ride, that is considered a bust if you don't go missed approach. Uh, if the approach becomes unstabilized, if your descent rate becomes too high, your airspeed becomes too fast, uh, then you need to go ahead and execute that missed approach. And if any required component of the approach or onboard equipment becomes inoperative, there's really nothing that can go inoperative other than the GPS. But if, if suddenly you get, you know, if your LPV enunciation uh, disappears, you're no longer in approach mode, then you need to go missed. Or uh, if you get an integrity warning on the GPS, then you need to go missed. And then anytime it becomes unsafe for any reason uh, to continue the approach in your opinion, uh, then you need to go ahead and execute that missed approach. That can be anything from weather, bad weather, wind shear, something like that at the airport, to something like you know an aircraft pulling out on the runway or you're uncertain of an aircraft's position on the airport, uh, you know, or a vehicle or something is pulled out on the runway. All right, as far as setting up for the flight, we will start at the top left and work our way to the right and then down like we usually do. As far as the aircraft goes, uh, aircraft selection, we want the Cessna 172 Skyhawk G1000. The Arista Blue is a third-party livery uh, that I have installed, so you won't see that unless you have that installed. Livery as you'd like it. The weight and balance, I have two full tanks of gas and two 170-pound occupants. And then failures and customization is whatever you want to do there. You don't want any failures and the customization, whatever you'd like to do there. Uh, as far as the airport, we are going to go to Pine Bluff Airport, which is Kilo Papa Bravo Foxtrot. We'll select that. And then you can either start on runway 36 if you'd like, or you can start on the ramp. Either one is just fine. I'm going to go ahead and select the ramp. And then as far as the time goes, we'll go ahead and set that up down at the bottom left here at noon. Uh, that's mostly for lighting conditions. And then we are ready to get in the sim and fly. And we'll set up the weather once we are in the session. All right, so as far as setting up the weather, we'll start with the right side here first. We want the altitude calculation at AMSL, above mean sea level, uh, so the cloud bases are even. Precipitation, I would recommend setting this at zero so that you don't have any additional restrictions to visibility other than the cloud cover. Uh, snow depth and lightning, you really don't need. And then temperature, I've set at 61-ish, uh, and that should be about 15 degrees at the surface in both Pine Bluff and Stuttgart with a standard Barometric pressure of 2992 or uh, 1013 if you're setting it at millibars. And I set the humidity at 1, which is the lowest setting, again, just uh, so you don't have any further restrictions on visibility other than what you're imposing with the cloud cover. I recommend having the two top layers. You're not going to be able to break out the top the way we have it set here. So have those two top layers just set at uh, zero uh, or, uh, you know, clear coverage. And then with this bottom layer, what we'll do is set it to overcast 100%. Density will be at 0.5. And this is, again, for visibility so that we can see the runway from the decision height. Uh, scatter, it really doesn't matter what you do with the scatter with a overcast cloud coverage, but I do have it set it to zero. And then I have the altitude top set up around 11,000 feet, and that should get it so that you're not going to break out on top. And the altitude bottom is set at negative 500 feet, which is roughly 1,000 feet underneath our minimums for the approach. And that's about what you need to break out uh, just a little bit above minimums. So that's how we have the weather set up. Now let's jump into the cockpit and talk about setting up the uh, avionics for our approach. All right, so before we get the uh, GPS set up, we'll get the uh, uh, PFD kind of set up and the autopilot set up. Uh, I do have all the bugs set. Everything is default except for I change best glide speed over to my approach speed, so I have a reference bug for that. And once I get airborne, I'll probably turn off the rotate speed. Uh, then we have uh, the CDI uh, plugged up to the GPS here, so we'll have the GPS information displayed there. Uh, and then I have set the heading to 360, which is runway heading. And then uh, I put 3000 into the uh, altitude pre-select there. And we'll get the transponder on a code here uh, shortly, as soon as we get a clearance. And uh, that's really all we need to do other than setting up the comm radios if you want to set those up. They really don't have to set up anything on uh, the nav radios for this setup. So let's take a look at the GPS and what we need to do there. 
All right, so now let's go ahead and set up the uh, GPS for the approach. Uh, I'll go ahead and press the procedure key, key to start loading the approach. I will uh, select approach. It's already highlighted, so I'll just hit enter there. If I had a flight plan in here or if I was going direct to Stuttgart, I can load that either way. And the airport would already be pre-populated here, but you can also just go into the procedure page and load the airport that you want the approach at. Uh, so I will just do that. I'll press the keyboard uh, key here to get the keyboard interactive here and then I'll type in KSGT uh, it says Stuttgart Airport Stuttgart Municipal that's the one that I want so I'll hit enter it brings up the list of approaches so I'll roll down and I want the RNAV GPS to runway 636 and you can see it tells me this is an LPV approach uh, so I'll go ahead and, and enter it asks, uh, how do you want to enter this approach? I want to go to Hogum intersection as the actual intermediate approach fix, but it lists it as an IAF, and it will ask us here in just a second if we want to fly the procedure turn. Uh, so I'll select that, and you can see it's got a detailed in here, and then I will hit enter, and it says fly course reversal at Hogum. No, I do not want to do that, so I'll use a small knob, sorry, the big knob to scroll over to no, and it will get rid of that procedure turn for me. It gives you the option to load up the minimums uh, from this screen, so I'll go ahead and do that. I'll turn it from off to barrow, then I'll use the big knob to go over to the uh, where you actually set the minimums here, and we'll scroll up. The minimums for this approach are 274. Let me make sure that is correct. Yeah, two, 474, excuse me, 474. We can only set in increments of 10. Uh, and so you never want to set anything that is below your MDA, so we do not want to set 470. We want to round up and set 480. So there we have 480 set. We'll go ahead and hit enter. It lets you take a look at the fixes. It's got Hogum and then Laius and then Marv, runway 36, climbing to 474, and then going direct to Zedek for the hold for the missed approach. That all looks correct. So I'll use the big knob to scroll down to activate and that will have me going direct to Hogum. So it displays that as the flight plan here. And we can see Hogum, Laius, Marv, runway 36. And then it's got the rest of the missed approach there. I can actually activate the cursor here and scroll down and look through the legs of each approach or each uh, leg. And you can see it actually shows me on the map uh, each waypoint as I scroll through that. It's also got the uh, vertical uh, points in there as well. So go ahead and hit flight plan to get out of that and you can see I can also scroll out this way uh, so I can see the approach uh, as well on the moving map there. All right so the GPS is all set up. Let's go ahead and call and get our clearance and we'll taxi out and get airborne. So the approach and departure control for uh, Pine Bluff area, which is actually Little Rock approach, does have a remote communications outlet on the ground there at Pine Bluff. So in real life, we would call them up on that frequency and tell them we're on the ground at Pine Bluff looking for our IFR clearance to Stuttgart. They would likely call back and say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel cleared to Stuttgart as filed. On departure, fly runway heading, climb and maintain 3,000 feet. Departure frequency is 135.4. Squawk 5502. So we read all that back and they uh, tell us probably something like hold for release or give us a clearance void time uh, that we need to be airborne by and uh, we get all that information back to them and then we are ready to taxi out, uh, do our run up and make our departure. So after we taxi out and do our run up, we'll make a normal takeoff from runway 36 at Pine Bluff and we will fly runway heading as assigned. So as you get the airplane stabilized, climbing up above about 1,000 feet, we should be able to switch over to a Little Rock departure and give them an initial call. Uh, we'll assume that they call back and they say Cessna 172 uh, Golf Hotel, uh, radar contact, proceed direct Hogum, resume, uh, resume own navigation, and climb maintain 3,000 feet. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the heading bug and uh, point it over towards Hogum initially while I get the GPS set up. And then once I do that, I'll go ahead and hit direct. It's already got Hogum loaded up in there, so I'm just basically redirecting it. Redirecting it. I'll hit enter and activate, and that will center up the CDI. I'll go ahead and hit nav, and now the GPS is, or the autopilot is tracking the GPS, and we'll track directly to Hogum. So we will go ahead and climb up to 3,000 feet, uh, level off, and cruise out the airplane, and then we will get ready to uh, fly the approach. 
So as we get about 10 miles from Hogum, uh, we have switched over to a different sector of Little Rock Approach. We'll assume that they call us up and they say Cessna 172 Golf Hotel. You are 10 miles from Hogum. Descend to maintain 2,500 feet. Maintain 2,500 until established on the approach. You are cleared straight in RNAV GPS approach runway 36 at Stuttgart. We read that back and then we'll start the descent down to 2,500 feet. I'll do a double check on the moving map here. I've got the range ring out at 25 nautical miles and it shows me that I am indeed 25 nautical miles from the runway 36 waypoint. So that MSA altitude of 2,500 feet is a good safe altitude to go down to. So I'll go ahead and roll in 2,500 feet into my altitude pre-select window. I'll just use a vertical speed descent of about probably 300 feet per minute. You use the uh, throttle to keep myself at the speed I was doing prior to the descent. And then that clearance also authorizes me to uh, use all of the procedure altitudes on the remainder of the approach. So once I uh, cross Hogum, I can descend on down to 2,500 feet. And then we can capture the glide slope or the glide path rather from there and proceed in on the rest of the approach. Okay, so the autopilot indicates it's going into an altitude capture there once it's good and level. Uh, a good practice in instrument flying is always to try to stay ahead of the airplane. So I have a good altitude hold on uh, 2,500 feet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my next procedure altitude, which is 1,900 feet once I pass Hokum. Uh, so I'll go ahead and set that in the altitude pre-select window, and I'll start that descent once I am on the other side of Hokum. Okay, so I've started the turn inbound on the intermediate approach segment uh, here, uh, crossing over Hogum and now heading to Laius. Once I see that uh, Laius uh, leg become active, I'll go ahead and start the descent uh, to that uh, procedure altitude. There it is. We can also see the uh, mode of the CDI has gone to LPV. So I'm gonna start a vertical speed descent, uh, about, eh, about 400 feet per minute. And then once I get down there, I'll probably be pretty close uh, to three nautical miles from the glide slope intercept. So I'll go ahead and configure the approach. So things are going to happen fairly quickly here. The important thing to note here is that I've gone from terminal to uh, LPV. So I know that I'm good. I'm getting good sensitivity on the approach. I'm getting a good signal integrity on the approach uh, so that I know that I'm good to go there and con continue the approach. All right, so I'm leveling at 1,900 feet. I'm about uh, 19, or excuse me, about three miles from the final approach fix. So I will go ahead and start to configure for the approach. Bring my throttle back to 1,800 feet. I'll bring the flaps out to uh, 10 degrees. We'll bring the window back here so you can see all that going on. Uh, let's see here. Once I get to 85, I'll go ahead and extend the full flaps. It's a good time to go ahead and activate the approach mode at this time. You see that turns the uh, uh, glide path magenta there. There is uh, 85 knots, so I'll bring my 20 degrees notch in there and the 30 degree notch in, and then I'll bring that power up to about 2200 to 2400 RPMs to keep it right at 70 knots. Uh, so the glide path is coming down about two miles from the final approach fix now, and this is a good time to go ahead and do our before landing checklist, so we'll get that all done. And now I'm just concentrating on using the throttle to uh, maintain 70 knots at uh, 1,900 feet, just label level in uh, or stable in uh, level flight. About 22-ish hundred RPM seems to be doing the trick. And then when that, once that glide slope comes down and uh, gets captured, uh, then I'll reduce the throttle to maintain uh, 70 knots as we go down that glide path. Uh, and then uh, we'll fly that all the way down to that decision altitude. So I'm watching up here on the, the uh, flight mode enunciator here. You can see glide path is per currently armed. I know it's captured when it goes over to the left side of the uh, screen there and goes to green. So glide path is capturing. I'll bring it back to about 1900 RPMs plus or minus. Uh, to keep it in. Probably don't need the markers on there because we don't use markers on this approach. So we'll go ahead and turn those off. And now all I'm doing is following the lateral guidance. If I were uh, hand flying, I'd want to make small corrections left and right to keep that centered up just like it would an ILS. And then about a 400 foot per minute descent, 350, something like that is what's keeping our glide slope centered up. And then I'm making adjustments on my power to try to keep it right on 70 knots. 
I'm going to go ahead and roll in my mist approach altitude. Uh, if I need to go mist approach, I've got that set in. Once your glide path is tracking, uh, it's okay to go ahead and do that. It's not going to affect the autopilot at all. Uh, so that's staying ahead of the airplane and getting ready for the next potential phase. And now we're just keeping ourselves on the glide path and on the lateral guidance from the GPS uh, down to our decision altitude of 474. Uh, where we'll take a look up and make a decision if we're going to go missed or if we can make it to a visual landing. And you can see it sequencing to that a second segment of the final approach fix that doesn't mean a lot for us other than positional awareness on the LPV approach. If we're shooting an LNAV approach there is a step down fix where we, we would need to meet at that intersection at MARV uh, but with the LPV approach that does not apply so we're just going to fly the approach all the way down to the decision altitude following the glide path. Looks like I'm actually needing just a little bit less than 1900, about mm, 1800 or so is keeping me on speed, so I've had to make some adjustments there. So just a little bit under 1800 RPM is what's keeping me on speed. That's 500 feet above the ground. I'll take a look at it, but about 500 feet, or about 570 AG, or uh, MSL, uh, about 100 feet above my decision height, and I'll take a look and see if we have a visual or not. So there's 600, there's 580, there's about 570, we'll take a look up, and there's our runway and identifier lights. I'll get the autopilot off before we get down to the decision altitude, and we'll just go ahead and transition to a visual landing. So that is how you shoot a uh, LPV approach using the G1000. So to try to judge when you are proficient at these approach, I would use the uh, Airman certification standards for uh, precision approaches with this approach, with these types of approaches, even though it is technically a non-precision approach. The terms that they use for the non-precision approaches in the Airman certification standards really don't apply to this type of approach because they talk about MDAs and this approach doesn't have an MDA, it has a uh, decision altitude instead. Uh, so I imagine in the real world, uh, more examiners are probably leaning towards using this to judge if you're proficient at the approach than the non-precision language. Uh, this can be found in the Airman certifications uh, for the instrument airplane rating. Uh, this is Area of Operations 6 Instrument Approaches, Task B Precision Approaches. The standards are that prior to final approach fix, you should maintain your altitude plus or minus 100 feet, be able to maintain your heading plus or minus 10 degrees, maintain your airspeed plus or minus 10 knots, and then accurately track radials, courses, and bearings. It doesn't give any further guidance as to what it considers accurate, but generally that's considered within 10 degrees or full-scale deflection on a GPS course. Uh, and then we're not using an NDB, but generally it's within 10 degrees on an NDB bearing as well. Uh, for the final approach fix down to the decision altitude, the standards there are that you maintain a stabilized approach. They're looking for uh, being on your approach airspeed, no excessive airspeed, and no excessive descent rate. And then allow no more than three-quarter scale deflection of the lateral or vertical course guidance. Uh, if you get to three-quarter scale and you go missed, uh, rather than trying to uh, continue the approach and accidentally going beyond three-quarter scale, then that is still considered, uh, it's not considered a bust at that point. Uh, they will generally allow you to go back and try the approach again. Uh, so that's the standard there. Uh, if you're actually out there flying the approach, though, technically you're allowed full scale before you should execute the missed approach. Uh, although I would probably, I would probably tend to execute the missed approach before it gets to that point. Uh, you should be able to maintain your approach airspeed plus or minus 10 knots and then immediately miss the approach at decision altitude if you do not have anything at sight or transition to a visual landing using a normal rate of descent and normal maneuvering. That concludes this video. Hopefully it's given you the knowledge and skills you need to competently fly LPV type RNAV GPS approaches using the G1000 on your own. As always, if you've enjoyed the content, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell to be alerted to new content, and share the video with your friends. 
Be sure to tune in for, to the next video in this series where we talk about how to fly this type of approach using the Garmin GNS 530 and 430. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.